Welcome to another episode of Coffee Conversation Show powered by the Emerging India Forum TIF and our tech partner Prime Forex Solution. The series is the Emerging Lawyer theme is balancing impact and corporate beyond the boardroom. Today we have special guest Imani Singh. She is based right now in uh, US and she is a distinguished corporate lawyer with over six years of experience in cross-border transactions mergers and acquisitions, and impact investing. Himani has a master's of laws degree from New York University and has a robust portfolio of working in top tier law firms in India and the United States. She brings a wealth of knowledge and insights to the table. So this will be an interesting conversation on cross-border and an international, uh, I'm in India and she is in the US so across different time zones, uh, thanks to Zoom, we are able to connect, meet. So uh, Himani, let me explain you the format. It mm -hmm. is in three rounds. One is professional, second, personal, and the third is a rapid fire fun round. And mm -hmm. you get to win this ebook, Shaping the Gen C Lawyer. Oh, wow. <laughs> Diana Mirvirani, I'm an author of 12 ebooks. So we'll try to send it across to your place. Okay. You Brilliant. Brilliant. So, so let's begin. So, Himani, my first question. How has your journey as a legal professional been till date? So let's recount. Uh, it's been challenging and it's been absolutely heartwarming as well. I've had I mean, I graduated from my law school in 2016, and since then I've been working on and off. I've done my master's in US, I've done some work here in US and in India. I have worked across different organizations, so it's been a joy ride for sure. It's been challenging. There's a lot of hard work involved in our profession, as everybody knows, right, from the time you decide to become a lawyer to the time when you actually get into the practice. So it's it's been great, and it's been grueling. I've come across a lot of brilliant colleagues and mentors and yeah i'm having fun and i'm looking for like a couple of more than couple of decades to come in which i'm going to be in this profession and enjoy myself more that's interesting so uh imani you've got an extensive experience in mna so what key strategies do you employ when you're negotiating uh mna deals I think the first and foremost, whenever you kickstart any M&A deal or any matter, any corporate transaction for that matter, is to get to know the client and the industry that they operate in. So that's uh, pretty important. So I think like the first time when a transaction comes to us as well, and we are trying to understand what are the deliverables, what are the clear, we try to set out clear client expectations that what do they need from us? And we try and understand that. And we also try to understand their approach towards the counterparty as to how stringent or how uh, easily they want to go ahead in the process. And we try and understand what is what are their non-negotiables, what are the things that are negotiables, how they want to continue on into the deal. And I think one key factor to keep in mind always is that, you know, when two parties come together to do business, they're actually looking forward to establish a relationship. And that goes on for a lot of time, like you sign documents for m &E deals and for debt deals, which go on for like, we make contracts which last 20 years, coming 30 years, 40 years. To get to a position where a contract sets the ideology between the two parties for these many years, it's challenging. So it's important to understand the goals of both the parties and proceed accordingly. And then there's the generic work around, around how you organize and structure the transaction and work around it. And the goal is to always deliver to the best of your ability. And I think the vision should always be that the clients end up having a great relationship and they do business together and without any glitch. Like that's the role of a corporate lawyer, that the transaction that we enter into, the contract that we negotiate doesn't go into a dispute. <laughs> so that's the idea. Beautifully explained. Uh, Himani, you've worked across several sectors like fintech, healthcare, renewable mm -hmm. energy, education. So, which mm -hmm. industry or sector attracted uh, you most, and what are the different legal challenges 
uh, you came across? So I think all the fields are challenging in their own way and they're very dynamic. Like renewable is on a rise for a lot of yeah. years now. There's a lot of solar and wind power energy transactions that you see across the across the equity deals and the debt deals as well in India. And that's been growing for a long time. And now like we, India as a country, being on the equator, on the on the side of the equator, we bank a lot upon solar energy. And then there's a lot of infrastructure projects in India. So that's that's definitely growing, and I think um, that's a that's that will continue to grow, and that's very challenging in itself. And then, obviously, technology is something that's always ever evolving, and the tech sector is growing fast across the world. And now, given AI has come into picture, and like that's changing the face of a lot of profiles and jobs, and how every sector will evolve in future. So that's something that that will be interesting to watch. Wow. So uh, my next question will be related to uh, your cross-border. Uh, yeah. Any particular case which is more is has been uh, impact your career as well as have good memories uh, and how did you navigate it? Yeah, so I think I've done like quite a bit of different type of transactions, but there was one particular transaction which I did when I was with SNR. And at that time, um, I worked with a brilliant team. My partners and my colleagues all were super brilliant. And we worked with this client who's like a philanthropic investor in India. And they were investing in a company in US who were, that was a medical company. And they were into research and they were trying to use gene therapy as a methodology to cure cancer patients. So that was a very interesting transaction in itself because Firstly, because of the motto, the work that the parties involved were doing, our clients were investing in such a brilliant company who was doing something really groundbreaking. And the second thing was that the it involved ODI, the Overseas Direct Investment Framework in India, which was changing at the time when we were doing the deal. So the funny thing is that the deal never really went through. We did a lot of work for like two years and that never really went through. Eventually, they had to resort to a different transaction structure to get the money. So the m and deal did not go forward, but it was really a brilliant way to unlearn about the old ODI framework and the new ODI framework and how that's impacting the network in our country. And I think it's it was in a like the idea in that deal was that the company was going to conduct clinical trials in US for the product that they manufacture, but the manufacturing was going to take place in India. So they wanted to have their plant that manufactures the drug in India. And I think in the manufacturing sector, India has a lot of scope. Like given the current geopolitical scenario, everybody in the West is looking for an alternate to China. And I think if the upcoming government, whoever comes to power, let's see who comes to power on June 4th, but whoever <laughs> comes to power, I think they should bank upon this opportunity where we try to establish our country as a channel, as an alternative to China in the terms of manufacturing. So I think it's a great opportunity for us. And that's why this deal is very close to me. <laughs> wow. So my next question, as you said, Kay, you have been very fortunate to work with a good legal team. So from the mm -hmm. legal industry, legal professional world, uh, who has impacted you and influenced you in your uh, profession as a legal professional? Well, I think there's a lot of stalwarts in our field. There are so many people in our country. There are like big names everybody can throw around. But I think growing up when I was still in school before going to law school also, I was reading up a lot about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was... Um, associate uh, judge in Supreme Court in US and her life journey has been absolutely fabulous. She was not only a great jurist herself and she contributed a lot to the legal profession and to the jurisprudence that we study today but alongside that she was also a brilliant woman who helped her husband battle through cancer and then eventually and he was also a judge and she helped him thrive through law school and helped him out and eventually he also came out became a judge in Supreme Court and so yeah, she's not only credited with being a great professional herself, but she also gave another stalwart to the industry. So I was absolutely bored by that. And fortunately, she was also one of the keynote speakers in my graduation ceremony when I was at NYU. Mm. So I think I am very lucky to have heard from her from up, up and close. 
And other than that, of course, you come across a lot of friends and colleagues in your profession. So I have a lot of mentors that I'm very proud of, and I always learn from them. They're my biggest teachers. Wow. So what you visualize from your uh, student days, uh, follow that person, and you put your uh, graduation, uh, sorry, masters, whatever you say, from that person, yeah. that is very memorable till, till the time you... Uh, in this world that is yes so. absolutely <laughs> so now coming to my question okay why did you select to go to new york university and how was your days over there i well i think i dreamed of new york i think every 20 something dreams of new york in their early <laughs> young days like they say that if you made it in new york in your 20s you're you're set so i think that was just always there in my mind and I uh, I I chose to do masters because the idea was to you know like get experience about a different educational system and Europe uh, while Europe and London were also an option I think US schools offered a lot of professional setting in which you learn so I was drawn to US schools and then New York it, in itself was a city that drew me and that's why I chose ended up coming to New York <laughs> and I had a great time I had a blast it's a it's a very short course, like LLM is a very short course. You have a lot of things going on in that short span. But I met so many people from like Americans, people from across the world and the professors in class. It was it was all very grueling again, but it was a fabulous experience. I think it's it changes you. You change after <laughs> experiencing the education system in a different country. And I definitely had that privilege. Wow. Uh, from your uh, profile thing, we came across that you were part of at uh, New York University of Law. You're part of the International Transaction Clinics. So, can you yes. uh, tell us something about what is this clinic about and what did you learn from over there? Sure, sure. So, International Transactions Clinic was basically a seminar come clinical credit course that I undertook. So, it was a long seven credit course that I took in my spring semester. So basically what the clinic does is it's run by one, uh, a professor who's, uh, her name is Professor Deborah Burand and she was, and she's an erstwhile general counsel at uh, US Development Finance Corporation. And she runs this clinic, which is which basically what it does is that it's a mixture of seminar courses in which you sit in a class setting and you discuss about impact. So the idea is to discuss international transactions and the impact investment sector. And you learn a lot about how different impact organizations function across the world. And then alongside the seminar classes, every student works in a group of three teams, like in a group of like in a team, which is which consists of three students and you have three projects each semester. So you also work with clients who Take pro, like you work pro bono with some of the clients under attorney supervision and deliver the product that is required of you in that project. So as part of my, my projects, I had three projects in this uh, clinic. Apart from the seminars, I worked on, I did one uh, survey come research project on gender lens investing. And I guess we'll talk about that more. I also did one on lending transaction with the impact investment organization who were investing in Africa. And I did one um, research and manual consolidation project with one impact organization who were trying to set forward their key strategies and vision around sustainable development and how they want that going through their portfolio of investments. So I did three projects and I worked with different people JDs and LLMs as part of these projects and it was an absolutely brilliant like experience because not only are you learning but you're also mm -hmm. like it's experiential learning so you're learning yes. from different L like people who have come from different countries you're learning from JD mm -hmm. students who are studying here in US for longer you have attorney supervision so there are like different attorneys who are involved in the impact space for a long time and then there were classes to have a lot of discussions and brainstorming. So it was a very good experience. And I also made a lot of friends <laughs> through this mm -hmm. clinic. So it was great. I think everybody who, like if your credit course allows, everyone who goes for a master's should try for an experiential course, something like this. Wow. So a lot of experience you have gained right from India to 
NYU University. Uh, <laughs> now, my next question will be for uh, Indian law students who like to go abroad to study mm -hmm. in a foreign law college. So, what are the things he or she should keep in mind while applying for any type of foreign law college based on your experience? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that you should be clear on why you're going for an education in a different country and try and channel that. So I think there are a lot of courses like and then there's about that, that's also about your specialization, what area you feel, area or field you want to specialize in and which universities offer what you're looking for. So I think even when you go for your master's, one question that always pops up is why do you want to do an LLM? You start probing the answer to this question right from the time you're writing your statement of purpose to the time you come go to that country and you interact with people and everybody asks you this question so i think it's very important to probe before you actually apply and understand why you're going for it and what are the goals that you have in mind and what you're trying to achieve from that that's number one and then i think then it's a whole process of you know like writing your statement of purpose and you're getting your recommendations and getting your TOEFL and like doing the actual applications. There's a lot of essays that you have to write as part of your application as scholarship. So all of that is just, I think all that, like if you work hard and if you just follow a structure, it, all of that falls in place. But the idea is to go with a clear mind. And once you go for your master's, you have to understand that it's a short course. It's going to be one year now and so you have to make the most of it so you have to do a lot of planning around it and yeah just enjoy and <laughs> make the most of your course wow very well said that probe inside before you yes. uh, it's for anything you uh, wherever india also you do uh masters why you want to do this why this Can why why this niche area you want to specialize which will yeah, add because absolutely. once you've selected something you have to stick to that you can't go right, and change absolutely. after you select something and by sports law is not my cup of tea, then you're stuck right. up. <laughs> yeah. Now your experience, uh, you've got as a pro bono, you volunteered as a pro bono bankruptcy lawyer. So why mm -hmm. did you select this niche area of doing volunteering in as a bankruptcy lawyer and what is the, uh, the learnings you gain during this as a volunteering during this project? So honestly, like I started this project just to kickstart my OPT here in US. So that's one of the ways you kickstart your uh, visa process. It's very grueling and it will take us another conversation altogether to discuss the visa system in US. But the idea was to just kickstart my visa so that I could stay here for longer. And I did that in 2020. My master's got over in 2020, which was the COVID year. So a lot of things were, you know, like, in an upheaval and things were unsettled. So that was the reason I started. I had some debt experience in my previous law firm. So I thought this could be a good fit for me. But it turned out to be a great experience for me because I actually worked on individual bankruptcies in this case, something that you would never do in a law firm setting because you would yeah. only work on the bankruptcies of corporates or, you know, like resolution plans and then M &E, like the mergers and combinations around bankruptcies. That's something that you do in a law firm, never really go for individual bankruptcies. So I actually got an insight into how does that function. And one project that I worked on really like, I think one key thing when you look at people who are going for individual bankruptcies is empathy. You understand that what sort of troubles people go through here. So like one person that I helped file bankruptcy, his individual bankruptcy, he was uh, some 80 year old man and he did not have wife. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have a children. And he was basically like he had some debt pending from a license, like a car loan, car license that had expired. And he was supposed to pay penalty on that. And he was trying to get that waived off by signing in for an individual bankruptcy because his only savings, the $10,000 that he had left, he wanted to save it for his funeral because you have to pay for your funeral if you don't have anybody. So that was kind of crazy. And I felt really like sad that mm. this is the life some of the people have to live through. But my idea was that any way I can help, I would step forward. So, yeah, you would see like a lot of people who are in these kind of in a soup in when you go for things like individual bankruptcy. And that's what my experience was. Wow, wow. Very touchy and emotional. And you uh, gained, touched 
impacted that person's life. That was very really wonderful. There is another area which uh, I like to bring about uh, for the viewers. You co-authored an article on gender consideration into deal documentation. Uh, so what can you elaborate on the importance of this initiative in modern corporate transaction and what what is this gender consideration this article which you co-author hmm. so i think in the impact space basically when you talk about impact investing the idea is that you invest like the most of the investments are to get profits that's the main goal impact investing is something where your end goal is profits as well as making some impact so that's the key idea of impact investing overall in very short and one of the major impact areas that a lot of impact organizations impact investors development finance organizations world bank our think tanks in india our impact organizations in india everybody that focuses on is women empowerment how does that take place so the idea is to invest in such a manner that it impacts the life of women and there are a lot of sustainable development goals so one of the sustainable development goals also talks about gender considerations and in this project what we probed into is that how are different impact investors and in development finance organizations are looking at gender lens investing investing with the lens such that it impacts gender and brings gender equality how, what is their mission how are they looking at it what is their vision how are they incorporating it in their deal documents so as you would know like in equity documents the role of a document is slightly lesser than in a debt deal like for example in an equity deal you would get shareholder rights you would get board seat if you are investing you would more than likely ask for a board seat and you get to look at the management and how the company is running but that's not what happens in a debt deal in a debt deal you only have the loan documents that you have signed that is the that is what gives you credibility the credit score right so i think what you write in a document becomes even more important in a debt transaction so our goal in this project was to understand mostly we were mostly focusing on debt transactions how is that incorporated in debt, debt transactions and how is that different from equity deals so the we uh, my teammates and i we interviewed a lot of uh, gcs across different organizations different impact investor organizations i think we interviewed around 22 people across different portfolio who had different portfolios of investments and we tracked took their viewpoint and then we collected a data matrix and drew patterns on how people are looking at investing and the gender considerations and including that in their documentation and this initiative was with one organization called calvert impact capital so they were the international transactions clinic client and so we interacted with them so it was a collaboration and there's a research paper it's on my linkedin it's on if you just search gender lens considerations across deal investments and look for Cal calvert or type my name the article should pop up and it's a good read i think it was one of the first articles that was written on this project and now multiple things have come after that there's further research has been done on this project so it's it's a great uh, concept and in the corporate world i think now when we talk about incorporation we've already started seeing how esg has started playing a role and we incorporate an annex sure which talks about esg consideration so the g of esg is governance and that includes involvement of women inclusion of gender even in our companies act for example public companies are required to have like there are some criteria where some companies are required to have a woman as a board director there has to be inclusion so this this is how it's flowing into our corporate setting slowly and steadily and hopefully in future as esg evolves more it will also the gender considerations in india and the impact space will also evolve alongside wow definitely uh me and my viewers would uh, go to this article and a lot of uh, insights which will be useful uh continuing you did your masters you mm -hmm. have just uh, came across a profile you recently added in 2024 you still continue your uh, learning you added right. a certification in mergers and acquisition job simulation from forge so what made mm -hmm. you go for this certification my first question and uh, tell us about this course 
So um, I've just been like, I've done a lot of work in India. My experience, my work in US is still relatively new. So I, this was a free course that was offered by this law firm that is famous in US. It's called Mayor Brown. And uh, they had this course on their website, which basically takes you through different stages of an M&A transaction and how to tackle that. So I just did this course to get an understanding of how US lawyers do it and what is there. Like I'm aware of a certain, um, you know, the for, the format of how a deal processes. And I just wanted to understand if there are any differences, how much do I know already, how much do I need to know more. So this pro course, that's why I did this stimula stimulation in which they give you like different uh, assignments. They give you, they create these um false settings in which they tell you there's, there's this client who has these requirements and this is what you need to do. How will you draft a document? What will you tell them? How will you advise them? And it's like one, two, three, four, they're like sub subsequent assignments. And then you're giving like uh, the standard formats to review your assignments against it and see. So the idea was to just get an understanding how, if it's, if at all, it's any different in US and it's not, it's not very different. I mean, the the process is the same. There's a term sheet, there's a diligence, there's a documentation, there's a post-closing. So it's pretty much the same. But yeah, I think the way the lawyers across the world write is slightly different. So like mm -hmm. UK documents are slightly different. India, mm -hmm. we write in a certain manner. US documents are a little different. So that's the only thing. But otherwise, an M&A deal is an M&A deal. <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. Now, uh, coming to my question, Technology plays a vital role in a legal profession's life. Uh, in your life, how did it help you and which legal tools have you uh, come across and used? So I'm not a super tech savvy person. I think a lot of lawyers are not. But uh, I think technology has definitely helped. Like as I have learned, it's definitely helped me. I use OneNote a lot to consolidate my thoughts, my notes, my work across. It's like a notebook in your in your digital format. So that helps me a lot collate my thoughts. When in law firm, I have used a lot of like, now the you don't have on-site diligences, you have data rooms. So that's facilitated and made our jobs easier. There's work share compared that we use in office. Like all corporate lawyers are very um, adept with using work share where they create red lines and it has really cool features where you can uh, create red lines to see the differences. You can do color combinations to see markings and strikeouts and additional language to see that. And that makes the reviewing very easier. Like when there are rounds and rounds of negotiations and revisions in a document, mm -hmm. red line helps a lot. It's a work share helps a lot on that. And you can also create those uh, red line only pages sort of a feature that you can use in WorkShare. So that's also very helpful where you only look at the changes and you don't have to go through the entire document. So that was pretty cool. And uh, now ChatGPT has also come into picture. So all your random questions that you cannot ask your seniors, you might think they're stupid. You can always direct to ChatGPT. And generally I interact with ChatGPT a lot, like a friend. So that's that's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, it's like an AMA. Ask yes. Me <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to... <laughs> It's helpful. I mean, the only thing you have to be by how, by how much it is helpful. And you have to decide. Absolutely. I mean, you have like to Google rely Baba. on it only so much. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. Baba. <laughs> I'm just waiting like for it to like pop out of my cell phone and become like a genie that I can interact with face to face. Yeah, people but have that is planned their itineraries, travel itinerary using chat GPT. Yeah, it has been yeah, full, uh, doing, uh, researching a lot of things. So basic information, it helps you. Yes. Then yes. you can start from your, you're now at, uh, what do you say, uh, point M with mm -hmm. ChatGPT. Right. Uh, so like Google, you'll be at point P with yeah. X. <laughs> so ChatGPT yeah, yeah, is like uh, a research tool. But with more added features, it makes your plans, many things. It's how you train them. Mm -hmm. It's all about right. prompting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, Imani, I want to dedicate this episode to women empowerment. Uh, we have a series of uh, Stri Shakti. So, what advice would you give to women lawyer out there who want to specialize in corporate law and cross-border transactions? I think that my advice, there's nothing specific that you need to do in the corporate world that you don't need to do in any other field. So, my advice is going to be very generic. The idea is to be confident and believe in yourself. 
and not feel like you're any less the i think people who are successful are because somebody else believes in them because they believe in themselves first so that is number 1 never underestimate yourself and then the uh, the second thing is awareness and uh, we we live in a world where it is a man's world after all <laughs> no offense <laughs> but it is a man's world and idea is to be aware that it is what it is and if you required if you're required to put in the extra hard work to excel in some field then you must do that the it's great to fight for women's rights but it's also important to keep fighting for yourself and keep working hard to be absolutely excellent in what you do so that nobody can point a finger at you so yeah that's it wow uh so very well said so now let's go to the next round the personal round and let's see money as a person uh, sure. let's go memories down the lane uh Tell us something about your family and growing up years in Lucknow. I grew up in Lucknow. I my father was actually uh, in Indian Air Force. He is now retired, but he has served in the Indian Air Force, and he then as a defense personnel, and then he served as a civil servant with the UP Secretariat. So when he switched from Air Force to UP Secretariat, is when he moved to Lucknow to live with my family, with my parents. Before that, I lived with my maternal grandparents in Ghazibad. so yeah my growing up years has been like this but uh, mostly lucknow is my hometown now that's what i recognize that's where my parents are and i have two brothers both of them have great influence on me one is elder one is younger so i'm the middle child and i have best of both worlds from both my brothers <laughs> and uh, yeah i mean that's that's pretty much it okay uh, so let's go to your next life that is college life uh, you went to dr ram manohar loya and you Uh, why did you select going to uh, this college and what are your fond memories over there i did not select to go to this college i wrote the clat exam and my rank only allowed me to go to this college so i chose that <laughs> like honestly growing up in lucknow back in the day i kept on praying that god get me any college other than this one because i want to step out of lucknow you want to get out of your home town but i did not get that opportunity but i'm glad like in hindsight i had a great time at armel i met i made great friends who are who i'm still in touch with there were a lot of like we were competing all the time there was something or the other constantly going on in law schools like there's a mooting going on or there's debate or there's classes or the some of the other college fest there's a cultural fest there's a sports fest so it was a lot of things happening all at once and those five years were definitely the best of my life I was young and I was exploring and I was figuring myself out and yeah I had a great time in law school with my friends and my I, it was definitely um, uh, the golden period it's called the golden period for a reason very true it was very really true cool. so let's talk about your uh, creative interest hobbies which you have developed from your uh, childhood and new hobbies which you have picked up in the uh, USA I loved painting as a child and when uh, life became hectic when i went to law school and uh, i had to do a lot of studying so that's kind of left behind but i still enjoy painting and i pick up the brush and do some of it and so that that definitely interests me during covid just like everyone else i picked up cooking <laughs> because mm -hmm. it was the need of the hour and now i really enjoy cooking indian food <clears throat> so my husband and i we, inv uh, we invite a lot of our friends from here in us to come and try the curry <laughs> so we make food and we enjoy um, like hosting people and getting them to taste indian food trying to do the marketing here and wow. i also like biking and like generally stepping out basic <laughs> exploring so i can see uh, plans of opening your restaurant in us <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so I can come over and uh, I'm also a foodie, so sure, like sure. Uh, Please feel free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my next question will be: uh, Share a memorable moment you have had with your family or friends recently. Um, um. So we go back to we go to we visit our families once a year, every year. and i got married very recently i got married in 2022 and last year was my first diwali after i got married so that was in my hometown but in a different house my husband's place but my family also lives in lucknow so that's an advantage 
much I got to spend Diwali as a married woman <laughs> with my parents, with my in-laws and my husband. And it was great. I It was, I think, one of the best memories that I have from last year, being in India in that festivity time period and everyone's around you. So it was great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, uh, Himani, you have uh, been in two places in the U.S., uh, that is, New York and North Carolina, now you are. Uh, yeah. So what are the different memories and what places, food, culture that it bring to you from the two places? Um, uh, New York, I was in New York for my master's as a student. So I, and New York is a city that never sleeps. So uh, I def, uh, I got to know a lot of people during my master's and I roamed around New York. I did a lot of uh, things that the city has to offer. There's Broadway, there's a lot of music concerts. Jazz is a music that is very popular in New York and New Orleans. So that's something that's new that I experienced when I came to New York. And um, after, like it's a it's a crowded city. I mean, if I have to draw a comparison, it's something like Bombay, uh, which uh, so and I had already lived in Bombay, so I had a great time in New York that way. And then North Carolina, I live in a smaller city. It's called Winston Salem, mm-hmm. and that's relatively smaller than New York. There are lesser people, but there's a lot of greenery here and a lot of open spaces. So it's a different experience on that front. And yeah, I mean, here uh, in New York, I traveled around in subway, and that's the mode of transportation here. Mm-hmm. We have a car. So the cultures are pretty, I think. Um, New York is a city that's generally very welcoming to all cultures. You would see people of all colors. And in my batch as well, in the LLM batch, there were people from across the world who, were, who had come to the city to do their master's. So it was very diverse, definitely. And yeah, I mean, I think mostly U.S. is a diverse country. You would see people and Indians are everywhere. So you find your community as well. And yeah, that's what it is right now. Also, like the there's changes in terms of big city versus small city. But all in all, it's great. Wow, very interesting. Uh, So Imani, how do you unwind after a particularly demanding day at work? I honestly don't do much. (laughs) Earlier, I used to read a lot. But uh, generally now I have to read a lot in as part of my day as well. So I mostly just spend time with my family. My husband, we watch television, we cook for each other <laughs> and we taste our food and admire it. And that's that's pretty much what we do. We go for walks in the evening. So that's um, that's very um, helpful. We like It helps you strike conversations and just generally mm-hmm. unwind. Yeah. Very good. Very good, very good. So it's become your, uh, your soulmate, your close friend. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So my question is uh, related to this one, uh, your friends, about your friends. What role do your friends play in supporting you through your highs and lows in your personal and professional life? They play a huge role. I mean, now it's been so many years, most of my friends are lawyers and only a few are not <laughs> lawyers. Mm-hmm. So they uh, definitely play a huge role in my professional setting. We have a lot of conversations about the work that we are doing whenever we speak. And uh, my friends, I trust them a lot. I uh, always turn to them for advice. Whenever I'm in a soup, whenever I'm making an important decision, I always keep them all connected. We always stay connected and find time to talk to each other and share our lives. And I think that's very important, like for your generally for your well-being to have a good community of people around you who are supportive and who understand you and who get it that where you're coming from. So, yeah, my friends definitely play a huge role. I have friends from all walks of life, school, college, uh, this law firm, that law firm. (laughs) So I always make friends and I stay connected and they play a huge role. Wow, that's very good. Uh, From your bucket list, what would like to do in 2024 this year? Um, I don't really have a long bucket list, but yeah, I mean, I enjoy painting and that's something that I've never really learned professionally. So maybe that's something I would like to explore when I have a little time. And yeah, I think the other thing is that uh, I travel around here in US and I have a lot of time to like look around here because now that I live here, but Europe is something that I've never really been. I've only been to London for a short time. 
So Europe is a place that I want to explore, travel to, and generally just see around, enjoy the beauty, take it, and all that. Wow. So it will uh, materialize this year. Uh... Hopefully, let's see. Finger crossed. Yes. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, describe Himani in one line. It's actually just three words. My Instagram bio says I'm tiny, but I'm fierce. So I'm a short person, but I'm fierce in my outlook. And yeah, that's that's what it is. So like chota packet, bada dhamaka. Correct. In the kind of fancy way. Yeah. Wow, lovely, lovely, lovely. We'll continue conversation. There is a lot of things to explore uh, with you. So now mm -hmm. let's come to the uh, this rapid fire, the fun round. Okay. You have to answer uh, quickly, funnily. Uh, mm -hmm. Your coffee? Hot. <laughs> okay. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Your favorite spot in New York City? Litigation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a crazy joke that Americans' favorite, what is their favorite sport that Americans enjoy? And people say it's football, but it's not football. It's litigation because they sue for everything. <laughs> Cool, cool. Fiction or non-fiction book? Both. Wow. Your favorite cuisine? Indian food. Chicken, mutton. <laughs> mutton. A dish? A Rogan Josh. Wow. Me too. Okay. Netflix binge or movie night out? A movie night out. Lesser commitment. <laughs> okay. One thing you can't live without? Uh, my family. Very true. I can see that. So you did very well, Imani, and you will get this book. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of uh, good things. Uh, that's why I, from my books, I was uh, going through, okay, which one should I gift you during the rapid fire round? So this shaping the Dempsey lawyer for future. I hope wow, you thank, thank you. Thank you. That's Please brilliant. Please your inputs, your comments. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, friends, it was a lovely conversation uh, with a cross-border lawyer that we had. A uh, lot of insights of uh, being a corporate lawyer and how you can settle in a different country. She has shared a lot of tips how you can select a foreign law college. So, do watch this episode when this is uh, published on the uh, Coffee Conversation YouTube channel. There are a lot of 100 plus episodes over there in different series. The Emerging Lawyer, Entrepreneur, Professional, CyberSec Professional, Sri Shakti, uh, then Startup, Students. So this is, uh, you get a lot of, uh, what do you say, episodes are there. You can learn from those episodes, uh, meet the person, connect with the person. And it is a lovely conversation which we keep on uh, happening, doing, and it's a lovely journey. So Himani, uh, we keep uh, when you're down in Mumbai, please do come over. We'll have physical coffee. And yes, definitely. Definitely. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. so, thank you.